Well, thank you so much, Roger, for being here with us today. Very well. Just want to talk to you about your music and your activism involving Palestine and uh, perhaps a little bit about your tour. And um, I thought maybe first that we'd start off by maybe taking a look at, um, you know, myself being a Canadian and perhaps yourself as someone from the UK, it'd be safe to say that we were exposed to a lot of mainstream media that wrongly frames Palestine as quote unquote the problem. And I'm just curious to know uh, when you first uh, began to see that in your own life. All right, that old story. <laughs> okay, well, that old story is 2005, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was on tour in Europe. Maybe it was a dot, so I can't remember what the tour was for. What. And suddenly in the middle of the tour of Europe, uh, my agent um, calls me and he says, look, there's a space of four days here. We could stick a gig in. Okay, whatever. Um, yeah, Highcom Park, Tel Aviv. Okay, whatever. So they put Highcom Park into my itinerary and uh, I immediately started getting emails. The first ones, interestingly, were from North Africa, from Moroccans and Algerians. And I'm going, what? And then I started getting some from the Occupied Territories because the BDS movement had just started. Literally, that was that was the year. So, uh, And I got an email from Omar Baguti, who I've since got to know very well over the years. Um, and I said, please don't... And explained everything. So, in fact, the show was sold out, but and I cancelled that show, having heard that, you know, Heiken Park is built on a Palestinian graves and blah, and blah. But I came to a, some kind of internal compromise because I knew very little about what was going on in Palestine. Um, and, and I moved the gig to a, um agricultural community where they grow chickpeas. It's a sort of peace village. It has two names. It's called, um, I think it's Wahat al-Salam in Arabic. I may be wrong. And in Hebrew, it's Neves Shalom. And it's sort of halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And uh, what's good about it is that they, it's Jews and Muslims and Arabs and Druze and Christians and agnostics, and they, and they all live together in this community growing chickpeas mainly. And but all their children go to school together, and so they and they teach kind of love and peace. So we did a gig there. We had sixty thousand people came. I think at the time it was the biggest gig that ever been in Israel, and it was a huge success. And they were all Pink Floyd, blah 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 blah, until the very end, uh, when I got up on my hind legs, and I said, "Now then." You are the generation of young Israelis who must make peace with your neighbors and blah, blah, blah. And they went from... It was uncanny. They went from that to... What the f*** are you talking about? We're not going to make peace with anybody. Are you crazy? They're animals. And that... I mean, they didn't say all of that, but they went very, very quiet. Anyway... We left, and uh, I went back the next year and uh, went on an extended tour with um, a, a lovely lady called Allegra Pacheo, I think it's her name, and we went all over the West Bank, and it was chilling beyond anything that I could ever have imagined to see back then in 2006 what was going on. And the absolute disdain and disgust with which we, me, with the British passport uh, in a UNRWA vehicle was treated by all the young Israeli border guards and people. I remember thinking at the time, if they're like that to me, what must be, they be like to the Palestinians? And of course we know. And now, to bring it entirely up to date, we know exactly what they're like to the Palestinians because they are, as we speak, committing genocide in Gaza 
I mean, you've seen so much in the time that um, you've been involved in Palestinian solidarity work um, from the time that you became uh, more proactive in the BDS movement. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering how specifically the events that have transpired since October 7th have affected you and um, how maybe that's... Well, it's been my, like anybody with a heart. Right. I, I spend my life teetering on the verge of tears. Yes. Well, then, miss. Because you can't possibly put yourself in that position, in their position, those mothers and fathers, those children, those 2.3 million, well, a bit less now, people living in Gaza, being bombarded by F-16s day and night, week after week after week. You can't, one cannot even begin to imagine what, what it must be like. And that it's being cheered on by the most powerful empire in the world is disgusting beyond all belief. And not to mention Benai Brith in your country. And Trudeau, he's cheering it all on as well. What is wrong with these people? How can they possibly be doing that? How can they still be trying to cast the Israelis as victims? I'm sorry, my voice was beginning to rise then because it's so insane what they're doing. And what the Israelis are doing is just, it's beyond all imagination. It's beyond our capacity to imagine such evil. It's a good, a perfect segue because I wanted to ask you, I mean, more generally, do you think that this says something about the dark side um, of humanity, uh, the the evil that people are still capable of? Yeah, well, now we're getting philosophical. And um, now we have to bring Yahweh into it. God has to enter the conversation at some point, because if you look at it very specifically in terms of what's going on there, um, God is evoked constantly. My father, I have to say, was a deeply um, um, avowed Christian. That's why my father was um, a pacifist and why he was a conscientious objector. When he was called up in 1939, he said, no, no, I can't. I'm a Christian. I can't kill anyone. Okay, so they said, well, actually, they said to him, will you drive an ambulance in London? He says, yes, I will. And he went and drove an ambulance from the beginning of the war until 1941, when having become politicized to some considerable extent, he had joined the Communist Party. He decided that the need to fight the Nazis trumped his Christianity so he went back to the conscription board and said, excuse me, I've changed my mind. Oh, who are you? Waters here. Well, uh, look, this chap's got a degree. Officer material. And that was the end of it. So, you know, he did his basic training and then officer training. And then he went to North Africa or to Italy for Arnold. And he was killed. He was you know, I wanted to actually ask about your beloved father because I know that he's, uh, uh, Eric Waters was commemorated in Italy um, decades later after World War II. Um, and I know that you have a memory of him from the time you were around five months, if I'm correct. So I'm wondering if that figures in somehow into your activism today. Yeah. I mean, interestingly enough, I do a song every night that talks about my elder brother, John, who was two years older than me, um, and, and uh, how he used to sit on my father's knee when my father was home on leave when he was doing his training, basic training and officer training and stuff like that. That's in the show every night. So you get a picture of my family and uh, with my big brother, me, my mother and my father. And we see that, and I say in this, I say at the end of the song, I was mercifully spared the memories that they shared. That's my father and my big brother, because I was only five months old when daddy died. So I have no actual memory um, of my father. Um, but 
I can't tell I can't tell you the story about the death of my father on February the eighteenth, nineteen forty four, without my heart and soul going to back to Gaza. Now I, I mean that's how much it affects my life now, and and everybody almost that I speak to. Uh, it's so unspeakable what the Israelis are doing in Gaza that it, that I feel my my whole body revolting against it with every breath that I take. But I'm happy to you know talk about the past as well. Um, to your credit, you're so tenacious despite all the pushback from some of these groups, as the one you mentioned in Canada. But now I breath, my friends. And so I'm wondering, really, like, um, where do you think that stems from? Where do you draw your strength from, despite this constant pushback that seems to be coming from all directions? My mother. My father was dead. My mother wasn't. And there's this story I tell, which is true. I'll tell it very quickly. When I was about 13, I was struggling with something. I've no idea what it was, some question why. And my mother could see I was, and she's looking over and she goes, What is it? Oh, mum, nothing. I'm just... Do-. She says, Listen, come here. I'm going to give you some advice. All through your life, Roger, you're going to come up against knotty problems, things that you have to think through and work out and decide what to do about, make decisions. Here's my advice. When that happens to you, read read, read, and then read some more. Find out everything that there is to know about whatever it is that is troubling you. Study the history, and don't just read the opinions of people who agree with you. Or read everything. Find out from all sides of it. When you've done that, the hard work is over. What do you mean? Well, what? well you've done all the heavy lift. Well, what do I do then, Mum? And she said, you do the right thing thing you know mum thanks what an incredible lesson to give an adolescent if if only that's what we were teaching our children instead of teaching our children as they do in Israel that Palestinians are animals that they're subhuman listening to Eilat Shekai we must kill all the little snakes and if there's a pregnant woman with a little snake in her belly kill her what? This is what you're teaching your children? No. I let Shekhar take a leaf out of my mother's book. Teach your children to do the right thing. That's it's such an important point, Roger, because I do wonder whether people are losing that sensibility sometimes. There's so many distractions. We're constantly being pushed to buy, to self-present in new ways. And I wonder whether people are losing sight of, of just that, of doing the right thing, they have despite... Yeah, they have many, many people. They are subject to propaganda, and as you, you mentioned the mainstream media earlier, the propaganda of the mainstream media, whose job it has become to echo what's bouncing around the echo chamber of the powers that be, the ruling class, and that's what they do. And people, it's very difficult not to be affected by that and not to take some of it in. But it is extremely dangerous because it is propaganda. And we all know how how, how this all got developed in the last 150 years or so, with people realizing that if you hold the key to the dissemination of information, i.e. the media, well, then you have all the power, you know, uh, goes back to Voltaire, or, you know, to, to the Enlightenment. You know, to, we Wise men have been writing about this now for like several hundred years, but it's hard for the wise things to get through to us ordinary mortals. Uh, and it's why is it hard? Because um, we live in a world where, well, so the United States where I live, that is a world where there's only one thing there's only one real God that we bow, bow down to, and that is profit. So neoliberal capitalism with profit on the altar is the thing that we all have to... Well, when you do that, you're screwed. There's no 
possible way that you can find your way out of the maze of that Friedman economic policy nonsense to enlightenment or to finding the love that you might have in your heart and empathy for your brothers and sisters all over the world, irrespective of their ethnicity or religion or nationality, to find your way onto that path is almost impossible. I feel that we're hardwired to do the right thing, but under these conditions of neoliberal capitalism, that it's almost conditioned out of us. Yeah, we have a... There, there is still hidden within most of us a, an absolute instinct when you see the old lady fall down in the street to go and help her. But in terms of the way our governments work and empire works, there, it, it's wiped out, it's erased. How is it erased? By propaganda to teach us that the old lady in the street is actually vermin and needs to be eradicated. Ooh, Ooh, I thought she, I thought it was an I thought it was like somebody's grandmother. Oh, it's vermin. Okay. Well, in that case, just I don't want to see it, but just or I do want to see it. I want to sit in a deck chair and applaud while they go on dropping bombs on Gaza. You know, I'm wondering if part of the reason in your shows you have these large visual signs. Um, it's just a curiosity I have. Uh, is because it's telling the audience you need to think about this. It's the important thing right now that we should be all considering um, as human beings, yeah. whether we like it or not. And it flies in the face of, I think, Western culture's celebration of the individual, I'll do me, don't bully me, I'll do what I want. And, but if you know you push that, to the extreme, then you have people just ignoring things all the time that they should be concerned about because it's comfortable. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, that's sort of why I made the new Redux version of Dark Side of the Moon was because this is a piece that I wrote 50 years ago and I could see that the business end of my music business were going to celebrate the fact that that piece of work is 50 years old. And I realized that people had, didn't really understand what, it's, what I was writing about when I wrote it. And so that's why I've made a new version that's more reflective and that's more, as my daughter pointed out to me, she said, this is great, Dad, because this is the 29-year-old you who wrote all this and the 80-year-old, 79 as I was, 10-year-old, looking back, backwards and forwards across 50 years at this piece of work and reflecting upon it from the age of 79 at the work of the 29-year-old who was like wide-eyed and this can't be right, you know. All that you touch and all that you see is all your life will ever be. This is it. You only get... And that, that is a central point of Dark Side of the Moon is that you only get one go at, as far as we know. So, no, I'm just being single, but I'm just wondering if there's any final observations or thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up. My my heart and, and my brain are so full of all the political as well as uh, humanitarian machinations of the Gaza question and the Palestine question right now that I find it difficult to escape from it. And all the <laughs> that I'm experiencing in South America with them trying to they just tried to cancel my show tomorrow here in Santiago in Chile, where I know I'm enormously popular, not just because the shows are sold out, they were in Buenos Aires as well. And yet the Israeli lobby still tried to get my shows in Buenos Aires cancelled on the grounds that I'm an anti-Semite, which I'm not, obviously. Right. It's such arrant nonsense, and yet they tell they make up stories and then amplify and then print them again and again and again and again and again and again. And I know we're not allowed to say it, but it's right out of Goebbels' playbook and Goering. This is exactly what they said and what they absolutely did. They said, we have to lie and lie and lie. And the bigger the lie, the more likely people are to believe. That's what these stupid are have been doing against me. 
your friends, which I know they're not, and mine in my breath. These are very, very dim people, and they are completely attached to the idea of the illegal settler colonialism of the Zionist movement in Palestine. And the other crazy people who've attached themselves to this are Christian evangelicals in the United States who support Israel like Biden. And why? Because they want to see the Jews all burn in hell when Jesus comes down in the second coming and they all go to heaven holding hands with Jesus. And they believe this <laughs> and And they're, they're prepared to sacrifice this entire beautiful planet that we live on and that is our... They're sacrificing the whole thing. I mean, I don't, if they should believe what they want, but they should not hold positions of political power because this is crazy. I would love to keep going and going, but I think... Um, I have I, a gig to do Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I would, if I had time, i keep going myself. But thank you so much. Not at all. Thank you very much for talking. And the privilege and all the very best.